Hello, this is Captain Corky inviting you to share in the adventures of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutters Bib and Dwayne. During this video, we will follow these historically rich cutters from their decommissioned status in East Boston to New Jersey and to Staten Island, New York, where they were prepared for the long tow to the buffer zone at the southern end of the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary. This location was chosen for the artificial reef site to ensure easy accessibility for sport divers to have an alternate dive site from the nearby Molasses Reef Coral Colonies, a reef that has been almost too popular for more than a decade. Before we start our artificial reef journey, here's a brief history of the Bib and the Duane. The Secretary class cutters were part of a seven vessel fleet. Only one remains active today. This fleet was built in the mid to late 30s. Transatlantic flight was just beginning and the Coast Guard projected a need for ships to be in position for search and rescue. The vessels were also built to prevent poaching by the Japanese fishing vessels in Alaskan waters. And there was a third purpose for the cutters, one quite familiar to today's Coast Guard. There was a problem with opium smuggling from the Orient to various outlets on the west coast of the United States. The cutters were used for drug interdiction back then as they were in the late 70s and the early 80s. During World War II, the Bib and the Duane operated under U.S. Navy control. With increased armament, the Bib was assigned duties in the North Atlantic, the Caribbean, Mediterranean, and Okinawa. The Duane served in the North Atlantic and was the flagship for the invasion of southern France. And on April 17, 1943, the Duane and her sister ship Spencer sank a German U-boat. The Duane rescued 22 crew members from the Nazi sub. Hundreds of sailors, merchantmen, and others owe their lives to the diligence and the bravery of the officers and the crews of both the Bib and the Duane. During their search and rescue missions, both cutters braved weather and war, retrieving survivors of torpedoed sunken ships and crashed or ditched aircraft from the icy North Atlantic waters. With growing admiration for the cutters themselves and the men that served on them, we are proud to present the Bib and the Duane, serving together to protect and preserve the marine environment and preparing to go on final duty. These are the cutters as first seen by anyone from Key Largo. The area dive shops initially kicked in $100 each to finance this first step in the artificial reef project. The Reef Association sent Bill Harrigan and Curtis Crewer to East Boston to videotape the ships and to ascertain whether they would be suitable as artificial reefs or not. As the old song once said, just one look was all it took. With a beam of 41 feet and an overall length of 327 feet each, the Bib and the Duane sat there in their decommissioned majesty waiting for their next assignment. Both cutters had been decommissioned in 1985, and they'd been sitting side by side at this dock for the past year and a half. When they were officially shut down, many of the fancier pieces of machinery and control mechanisms were removed by the Coast Guard. The lifeboats were gone, the five-inch guns had been removed, and there was this funny-looking, very cold white stuff laying all over the decks. Inside the cutters, desks, chairs, and training manuals were waiting for the next crew to come aboard. With air horns quiet and smokestacks still, Bill and Curtis began their tour of what was to become the most exciting artificial reef project in the entire country. The main masts on both vessels were awesome. If the masts were to be left in place when the ships were on the bottom, they would stick out of the water by 15 feet. It was decided that the main masts would have to go in order to comply with the 50-foot clearance from the surface rule that was part of the reef site permit.
The large bridge portholes on the bib had been removed at the time of decommissioning. The view from the bridge to the bow, or from the bow to the bridge, was absolutely inspiring. Even with the funny looking white stuff on the decks, it wasn't hard to imagine the tropical marine life that hopefully soon would be playing around the anchor chains and the windlasses. Bill and Curtis returned to Key Largo and reported that all was well with the cutters and the videos they shot sent the dive community into an artificial reef frenzy that couldn't be stopped. The next phase of the project was when my wife Terry and I went to Boston for a week to solicit bids for cleaning and for towing the cutters to Key Largo. The snow was gone, but it was still cold. And as I moved through the main galley with my video camera, I'm still not sure whether I was shaking from the cold or from the anticipation of diving through this compartment of shiny stainless steel in the very near future. One person I'd like to thank at this time is Chief Warrant Officer Joe DeBricco, U.S. Coast Guard, Boston. Joe was in charge of overseeing the Bib and the Duane during their storage period, and he was our main contact to inspect the vessels. Thanks, Joe. I told you we'd make you a star. With the East Boston skyline visible through the bridge portholes in the Duane, we begin our control station tour. Compasses, radios, throttle stands have long since been removed but brass portholes and switches and phone hangers remain as possible artifacts to be sold to raise funds for the project. From the bridge, we move back into the chart room. More portholes, more switches, more phone hangers. And from the chart room, into the communications room where we find the insignia of the Duane painted on a bulkhead. Terry and I returned to Key Largo with a towing and cleaning contract that we had put together with a Boston company called New England Marine Towing. The contract was for $128,000. The Reef Association expected the project to cost around $150,000 overall and preparations were already underway for fundraising. Several months of government red tape and several months of finance gathering brought us to the middle of September of 1987. A five-man team consisting of myself and my son Joe, and Todd Stevenson, John Grintner, and Ricky Thaler departed for Boston to prepare the cutters for the beginning of their journey. We rented a truck in Boston and we started removing bronze and brass items from the two ships. We rigged a line and some pulleys from the ships to the truck and began loading hundreds of portholes and artifacts. Each item as it came from within the ship seemed more unique than the last. Here's a solid brass mast inspection plate from the bridge of the Duane. All of these items were to be used for the fundraisers being planned back home. The ships had been donated to Key Largo by the U.S. government, but they had to be carefully cleaned so that they wouldn't create pollution of any kind once they were on the bottom. The cleaning was to take place in New Jersey, but first the cutters needed to pass a Boston Coast Guard inspection. All of the open portholes had to be sealed to ensure watertight integrity. Neither we or the Coast Guard wanted the ships to take on any water or sink on their way to the New York Harbor. We covered all 200 portholes with plywood. We rented a pump and we ballasted the fuel tanks with salt water to give the ships proper trim while being towed. While we were doing this, people were busy with the project back in Key Largo. The Monroe County Tourist Development Council had donated $95,000 to the Artificial Reef Fund. 
Steve Frank and Dick Drake were busy gathering donations from merchants and residents of the Upper Keys, and local dive shops were on the phones and on their feet collecting donations door to door. Our team worked for two weeks securing the ships and loading artifacts, and the list was endless. Lights, switches, tachometers, ships' phones, brass hatches that weighed 400 pounds or more, and of course, the kitchen sink. We lived in the Divers World video coach while we were there, and day by day, the rental truck got heavier and heavier and heavier. If you've ever watched Spencer for Hire on late night TV, then you may have seen some of these tugboats. Filming for that show was done on occasion at this very same dock. With the truck loaded down with brass and bronze, it was time for the tugs to arrive and prepare for the tow to New Jersey. Busanac was to be the lead tug for the first leg of the trip. Heavy tires were brought on board and used as bumpers between the cutters in case of heavy seas. More tugs were to arrive and assist with the tow. This is the Tammy M. And here's the Russell Jr. Finally, early on a Saturday morning, the 3rd of October, 1987, the Bib and the Duane moved away from the dock for the first time in almost two years. Underway at last. From Boston Harbor, we traveled to Cape Cod and went through the canal at night. And the next morning found the cutters in open ocean, about 50 miles from New York City. At midday, the Busanac slipped her lines from the tow and prepared to turn the job over to the Lucinda Smith. Lucinda was out of New York and would be the lead tug into New Jersey and also the tug chosen to tow the Bib and the Duane all the way to Key Largo. She took the Bib and Duane under tow and brought us into New York Harbor and upriver to Bayonne, New Jersey. Now I know that New Jersey is supposed to be the garden state, but come on boys and girls, can you say grungy? I knew you could. 
This is the standard cleaning plant in Bayonne. It was here that the cutter's fuel and oil bunkers were cleaned. Each cutter held over 160,000 gallons of number six black oil and several thousand gallons of lube oil. All of the storage tanks were pumped dry and then steam cleaned and then pumped dry again. And all of the fuel and the oil transfer pipes were steam and hot water flushed. All bilges were steam cleaned and pumped out. Part of the time, cleaning was done with dockside equipment, although some of the cleaning was done with large steam cleaning barges. We spent a full month in New Jersey, and by the time we moved the cutters over to Staten Island, we were beginning to worry about towing them to Key Largo during the hurricane season, so we increased our work speed a bit. I was told that these electrical transformers contain hazardous toxic cooling oil, and that we would be charged $11,700 to remove and dispose of them. Well, they looked air cooled to me. After careful and slow inspection, it turned out that there wasn't any toxic oil, and the Reef Association was saved that expense. Everybody wants to be an actor, don't they? Here's the main mast being removed from the bib. It was a five-hour project in itself. The mast with crow's nest weighed almost four tons. Inside and outside the cutters, Welders were busy sealing doors that led into areas that were dangerous for divers to penetrate. It was decided by the Reef Association that everything from the main deck down would be sealed off and used for marine life only, and that all compartments from the main deck up would be for diver exploration. Barrels of trash were removed, and deck hatches were sealed and barred. Interior doors were taken off of their hinges, and escape holes were cut in areas that had limited access. The main galleys still contained enough stainless steel cooking equipment to open a small restaurant. Compartments were checked and double-checked for any possible diver hazards. Hanging wires were trimmed and more below-deck access hatches were secured. We found one lube oil tank on the Duane that hadn't been cleaned so the cleaning barge had to return and finish the job. We had now been in Staten Island for almost a month. At last the cleaning and the cutting work was finished. The Lucinda Smith returned with her fuel tanks full and her refrigerator well stocked for the long tow to Key Largo. With the help of the assist tug Kate, the cutters were slowly pulled away from the shipyard dock. The 
bib followed the Duane for one last trip down the river, past New York, and out towards the open sea. All the river traffic that day got their final look at the two cutters that had more than distinguished themselves during their active careers. Few of them, I'm sure, if any, realized that the cutters would be continuing their duty status, 120 feet down, of course, in the Gulf Stream of the Florida Keys. When we reached Ambrose Light outside the New York Harbor, the tugs began stretching out the tow. The 9-inch hawser from the bib to the Duane was 600 feet long, as was the 3-inch steel cable from the tug to the Duane. After a final check on both cutters, the Kate came alongside the Lucinda and dropped off a crew member that had ridden the Duane downriver. With a few last minute instructions and some goodbye waving, we pulled away from the Lucinda Smith and decided to take one last look at the tug and her long tow. U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Duane, launched June 3rd, 1936, decommissioned August 1st, 1985. And the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Bib, launched January 14, 1937, decommissioned September 30th, 1985. The towing company, figuring that the tug would move along at about five knots with the cutters, said that we should expect to see them in Key Largo in six or seven days. As it turned out, with bad weather and 20-foot seas encountered off of Cape Hatteras, the cutters would not be seen again for 13 days. Thanksgiving Day, 1987, Commander John Devlin and the Navy Experimental Dive Team worked with us to prepare for the sinking. They brought three-inch Navy pumps that were to be used to sink the cutters. The pumps were loaded on a boat that would be our work platform alongside the bib and the Duane. Pump hoses came in 10-foot sections. 30-foot pieces were assembled on shore and loaded on the boat. The pumps were primed. The pumps were tested. And the cameraman got no respect. At 6 a.m. November 28, 1987, we boarded the Duane with all of our tools and torches and the tug Lucinda Smith was real glad to see us. The bib was still attached to the Duane and lay off to our starboard side. The 95-foot Coast Guard cutter Cape Fox from Key West was there to meet us. 
Our plan was to have the Cape Fox take the bib in tow while the tug positioned the Duane exactly over the permit site. The theory was good, but it only partially worked. The Cape Fox did come alongside and get the bib, but with the strong current and the size of the bib, it was the Cape Fox that was taken in tow. By the time the Duane was anchored, the bib had pulled the Cape Fox about five miles out into the Gulf Stream and far to the northeast. While the tug was getting the Duane into position, our crew attended to the preparations. All superstructure doors were cut off of their hinges so as not to slam shut by the current at some future underwater date and possibly trap a diver. the wooden porthole covers that we had installed in Boston had to be removed. Some of the doors proved to be a bit stubborn. Here's Joe and Mark wrestling with one. Slowly against the current, the tug moved us into position. On the bow, the Navy team was waiting for the word to drop anchor. These anchor chains had been rusting in the chain lockers for two years, and no one was sure whether they would come out or not. When the brake was released, nothing moved. The second pelican hook was hit, and again, nothing moved. During this time, the current had moved us and the tug off of position, so the tug had to move us back on again. While this was happening, the crew rousted some chain out on deck. This time, when the hook was released, the Duane dropped her 5,000-pound anchor for the last time and officially made Key Largo her home port. Now that Lucinda was free to go get the bib, apparently her twin diesels got quite a workout during the past 13 days. As boats gathered in the area to watch the event, the workboat came alongside with the Navy pumps to start the sinking process. More spectator boats gathered as well as a news helicopter. It had been decided long ago not to use explosives for the sinking. Instead, we cut holes in the transom about four feet above the waterline. The pumps aboard the workboat were running strong. Crossbars were fastened across the transom holes to prevent divers from entering that below deck area.
water hoses were switched from one compartment to another to flood the cutter as evenly as possible. As the day wore on, more and more spectator boats arrived. When we were in the shipyard at Staten Island, I used a huge water pump to fill all of the fuel compartments. The cutters needed to be in ballast for the trip to Key Largo anyway, and during the scuttling of the ships, that was 160,000 gallons per ship that we did not have to fill. Even so, it took seven hours on each cutter to pump enough water into the bilges to bring the stern holes down to water level. long last nearing the completion of a project that started almost around the time that the Bib and the Duane were decommissioned. Below decks, certain doors on both cutters had been secured open and other doors had been secured closed. There was a path that we wanted the water to follow once it started coming in on its own. At this point, I want to thank you for coming on this adventure with us. There's more to come, so keep watching. Although we started showing you the scuttling preparations on the Duane, what you're going to see next is the sinking of the bib. The Duane sank after dark the night before this, but she sat on the bottom in an upright position as pretty as could be, and we're going to go for a dive on the Duane as soon as we sink the bib. Also now, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the project. There are credits at the end of this video, and I hope I remembered everybody, but in case I didn't, thanks again. It was a project of such scope that at times it felt like an impossibility, but we all made it come together, and it was worth it. With this one last look from the aft mast of the bib, I'm going to leave you for a little bit and let you enjoy the spectacle. Saturday afternoon, November 28th.
storage rooms. Do you have any idea how much how much ammo they used to carry total? I couldn't really truthfully say, uh, but I know that uh, when they were taken on ammunition, the smoking lamp was out for uh, quite a while. The smoking lamp, incidentally, that's when there's no smoking aboard ship whatsoever. And uh, the smoking lamp would be out for several hours while we were taken aboard ammunition. So we took aboard quite a bit. There was two 5-inch 38s forward, one aft. There was 
two quad forties aft, two quad forties forward, and several twin forties, along with miscellaneous uh, guns like twenty millimeter and so on. Any depth charges? Pardon? Were they doing it, carrying any depth charges at that time? For uh, submarines? No, at that time they discontinued the depth charges. It was these were strictly uh, anti-aircraft. Uh, uh, guns for uh, to defend ourselves against uh, heavy aircraft. How close did the bib get to any action? Well, down in, uh, in the invasion of Okinawa, uh, hardly a, a day or night went by that we weren't under aerial attack. Uh, and that went on for the better part of three months until, uh, until the island was really secured. Any close calls? Oh yeah, we had a few clo co close calls, all right. And there was uh, the Terra, which was uh, an anchorage uh, very close to us. They took a direct hit and uh, sustained severe damage. And uh, consequently, they had, they had to go back to the States to be uh, repaired. The two storms that stand out in my mind are two typhoons down in the Pacific. And uh, one was in September of 1945, just after the uh, war ended with Japan. And uh, to say that it was an ocean is putting it mild, absolutely putting it mild. And uh, according to the inclinometer, an inclinometer is what tells you the, the role that a ship has taken. And that rolled 65 degrees. I saw it with my own eyes. It was some roll, I'll tell you. And uh, the throttlemen, uh, the men that were on the throttles, as they'd come up on the crest of a, uh, of a swell, uh, first of all, the, the nose of the ship would dig into the, into the ocean. And then the ship would ride up to the crest of a swell and when it started down the other side, the screws would come out of the water. And those propellers would take off like jet engines. And it was the throttleman's job to cut down on the, on the steam going into the turbine so they wouldn't run wild. And they had some job for themselves for three days during that storm, I'll tell you. They were standing shifts of 15 minutes. That's how bad it was. You couldn't, you couldn't stand any longer than that. I know it's no exaggeration at all when I say those seas had to be 100 feet high without any exaggeration because they were way up over the mast. And you'd, you'd look up at that swell and you'd be looking up at a 45 degree angle. This, this sounds, well, you'd never be able to imagine it unless you were actually on the spot on that ship or, or on a ship under those conditions. Well, the admiral that we had on board, we'd see him from time to time, but he stayed pretty much to himself. And the captain was always the captain. The admiral never had anything to do with the running of the ship. He was there strictly to, uh, as an overseer of the whole operation. But uh, Captain Herman Deal was always in command of that ship. Well, the way we the way we did our laundry on the on the ship was uh, we had a five gallon milk can, and uh, we uh, took and cut a hole in the cover of the milk can, and we put our clothes into the milk can along with the along with the uh, water and soap powder, and there was a hole in the cover of the milk can. We put a toilet plunger through the hole of the milk can, and we churned the clothes like they were butter and they came out spotlessly clean. Why did they call you Squeaky? Well, why did they call me Squeaky? I suppose because of my voice. 